If President Trump follows through with slapping Mexico with tariffs over illegal immigration, it appears the North American trade deal could be impacted. The United States-Mexico-Canada agreement was signed in November but still needs congressional approval. In an op-ed for CNBC, Democratic Congressman Andy Levin of Michigan calls both moves reckless, saying in part, these actions reek of a political fight that's more about energizing partisans than about protecting American jobs. Joining me now to expand on his stance and what's happening in Washington is Congressman Levin. He's the vice chair of the House Education and Labor Committee and serves on the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Congressman Levin, welcome. Thanks so much, Jamal. It's He's also a homeboy because, you know, yes, I'm from sir. Detroit, so we're uh, next door neighbors. Awesome. <laughs> Michigander. That's right. Um, so uh, tell me about uh, the CNBC op-ed that you wrote and your position on the president's USMCA, which is a lot of people call now. NAFTA 2. Yeah, I call it NAFTA 1.5 because it's just not enough different from the original NAFTA, which was a big disaster for working people in the United States. Um, by 2013, it, we'd lost 800,000 jobs because of NAFTA, mostly good paying manufacturing jobs that U.S. companies ship to Mexico just because they pay Mexican workers highly suppressed wages, one to two dollars an hour. Mexico has, of all the OECD countries, the highest percentage of their economic output goes to profit and the lowest goes to compensation of any OECD country. Mm -hmm. People are closing factories in China and moving them to Mexico because the labor is so cheap there. And so any new trade agreement would need to tackle that problem of the whole protection contract system that they have in Mexico. So uh, how would you answer the criticism some people have, or the, I guess the note some people have, that if American companies are going to put manufacturing in low-wage countries, we actually might want those jobs to be in Mexico because that helps build the Mexican economy up and keeps Mexican workers happy. They're able to stay home and not migrate to the United States. And that may be better than having them move to some other country, not Mexico. Great question. Here's the problem. NAFTA, 1994, right? Yeah. So many American manufacturing jobs went, have gone to Mexico. Mexican workers haven't seen the benefit. Mexican wages in real dollar terms are lower today than they were in 1994. Well, the question I guess I'm asking so is, it has where would, would they go somewhere else other than Mexico? Right? Do you want those jobs to be in China? Do you want those jobs to be in Argentina? Or would you rather those jobs be in, the, in a neighboring country where the US, is, uh, the US has some interest? False choice, I want those jobs in the 9th District of Michigan. Okay. I really do. We, I don't buy the premise that in order to be profitable, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, or Nissan and the others have to make cars in low-wage countries. They should make the products they want to sell in the United States in the United States. German companies, you know, sell cars in Germany, they make them in Germany. They make cars in Sweden, they make cars in France. You know, we need to make cars in the United States. And the way to, I'm for workers in Mexico too, but in terms of Mexican workers' interests and American workers' interests coming together, what needs to happen is that Mexican workers need real rights to form unions and bargain collectively. So right. that, that's where you really and, get and to you the And you spent some time it. working in the labor movement. So, yes. so I'm wondering, what is the labor movement doing on an international scale to ensure that workers in some of these low-wage countries have the ability to compete and bargain with some of these international? Because if, if corporations have gone global, has labor gone global enough to provide a venue for workers to advocate? No, because the whole international trade regime that we've created is completely dominated by corporations. It, it, the unions have hardly had a seat at the table. If you think about it, there's been no trade agreement that said workers of the world can all join the steel workers, the auto workers. That's not even on the table. And so, so why not put it on the table? It's, we should. Let's look at the reality in Mexico. Mexican workers show up to work at a place. Normally, there's already a contract in place that they don't even know is there with a union that they don't even never voted for. And that contract, it's called a protection contract, 
It keeps wages low. The workers never have any say in it. So what the new law that the, the, Mex the, the Mexican regime has passed to prepare for this new NAFTA says is that those protection agreements have to go away. Mm -hmm. That Mexican workers have to have a real chance to vote on a union and a real chance to vote on a contract like real union workers so do in the good. United States. Good. Here's the problem with it. Could it really happen? Uh, Mr. Lighthizer, the U.S. Trade Representative, has said there's 700,000 protection agreements in place in Mexico. And within four years, they're all going to be reopened. Those workers have a real chance to vote. You know how many union elections were conducted in the United States last year? 1,250. How could Mexican authorities, with way less resources than the United States National Labor Relations Act, with not the infrastructure in place, oversee 700,000 or 500,000, whatever it is, new uh, contract openings, uh, elections for real unions. It's sort of hard to imagine it happening in practice. And that's, we're talking about if American workers are going to have a fair shot, Mexican workers have to have a fair shot at real voice on the job. So there's, and, a, yeah. there, there's a fair amount of, uh, I, I think you, you stand on a footing that looks at the jobs that have been taken away because of trade. Right. There are other people who also say a lot of these jobs have been taken away because of technology. And I don't hear um, a lot of people talking about the danger or the threat to American workers from software and robots. We talk about it all the time. But here's my thing on this. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not anti-technology. If you look at countries where workers have real rights, they do not fear technological change. Take Sweden, 70% unionized. Swedish workers don't fear that if their com company gets the latest technology, is the most efficient, adopts whole new processes, that their job's going to go away because they have a union contract which says it's not. And if that company says, Jamal's you know, particular uh, job, the, the thing you do needs to change, you're going to get retrained right. in that company. So the workers have an interest with the company completely aligned at being the most up-to-date technologically, the most efficient. And so there's no reason that, that so how workers do do having power or unions has to be at all in conflict Look, my, with uh, racing into the future. It's I got all, you. My, yeah. my grandfather came from Alabama to work in an auto factory in Michigan. And, uh, and you know, and with, with back then, they put all the black workers in the worst jobs. In yes, the they did. Um, I yeah. remember in fourth grade, my mom, who passed away 10 years ago, but she and I, our favorite field trip we ever went on was to the Ford Rouge plant. Yeah. And I saw the racism right in front of my eyes. The, the African-American workers were doing all, they were still making steel mm -hmm. then. And the, the frightening thing of pouring molten iron ore or whatever into molds to make the car parts, sure. it was all African-American workers doing the hot, hottest and most difficult So now job. we're looking at higher skilled jobs that are being yes. created um, and better quality jobs yes. for those higher skills. But we've got a skills mismatch, fewer, particularly in yeah. places like Southeast Michigan, right? You, you, know, you can yes. drive through the streets of Detroit, you've got some really great um, exciting things happening downtown, but you've got sort of a sea of of people who right. are people pretty desolate true afterwards. True Detroit's Absolutely. So I'm like a donut yeah. hole in the middle of the city. Yes. Um, the question is, what do we do to, to, to close that skills mismatch between the workers who are sitting idle and the jobs that are being created that are more high-tech, high-skilled jobs? Well, here's what's sort of weird about me as a new member of Congress. I'm you did both, labor. I mean, you worked I, in the state well, government. Well, you worked not, for labor. Yeah, I'm not only you, you know what happens. I'm not only labor in the sense of unions and worker voice and power, I was the chief workforce officer of the state of Michigan. I spent four years running the whole workforce system, the job training, adult ed, career ed, help for people with uh, disabilities. We know that manufacturing today, to stick to that area, is completely different than it used to be. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go bust rivets in a factory. You're going to run a computer that runs a robot that does that. You have to be a CNC operator or you know have right. computer skills. So we need to help the workers out there get the skills they need to do those jobs. We know how to do it, and we just have to invest in it. When I was in the state government in Michigan, I created something called No Worker Left Behind. We took all the, the blizzard of federal programs in the U.S. Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Education, veterans, and HHS, because you got the whole welfare to work thing and, yeah. and TANF money. 
we put them all behind the Wizard of Oz curtain and we said, the, the worker who lost their job doesn't care about what box they fit in bureaucratically. They need a J-O-B, they need a new career path. So we said every worker who's unemployed is eligible for no worker left behind. And what do they get? No matter which program they're being paid for by, they get up to $10,000 of free tuition at any Michigan community college, university, or other approved training program, plus childcare and transportation if they need it. And the that only skills limitation mismatch is, and spatial mismatch, because you got people who live places where the exactly. jobs don't exist. Exactly, and the only limitation was, you, you're not studying French or anthropology, you're studying for a certificate or degree that leads to an in-demand job, according to your, in Michigan, we call it the Michigan Works Agency. So I bet you worked with my friends over at Focus Hope a little bit. A hundred percent. Focus Hope, yeah. yes, absolutely. They were an integral part of this. And we put people to into programs that really led to a job that could support their family. I mean, that's what people want. All right, so Senator Mark Warner from Virginia has been thinking about gig workers and people who are temporary workers, yes. people who are, I mean, whether you're a nanny or you're a, a child care um, person who's working an hourly wage, but yes. you're not in a unionized kind of environment or yes. regular environment. He's got this portable benefits idea that he thinks we can get workers who they can, you can carry your portable benefit uh, package, your account with you from workplace to workplace, from Uber to Airbnb, whatever mm -hmm. the job is that you get. Yes. How do you think about things like that in this modern economy? Should we be looking for some uh, modern ways to make sure workers still get the benefits that labor and so many other groups fought for for so long? A hundred percent. And Senator Warner's a big leader in this area. I worked with him at, when I was on the board of the National Skills Coalition after I left state government. So he really is a great thought leader in this area. But here's the thing. Workers, we don't want to accept the notion that you need to go do two, three, or four jobs in order to make ends meet. We need one job to be able to support a family. And so, what? We, you know, we need $15 an hour mm -hmm. as a national minimum wage, like we have in our Raise the Wage Act. And we, we cannot accept the idea that we're all going to run around like chickens with our heads cut off, doing two and three and four jobs, none of which provide adequate benefits uh, in order to get by. That's why we have such low unemployment. But people aren't happy. People aren't happy. People aren't happy. The, income, the incomes aren't going up for a family, even though the job Right. And let me just up. tell you the model for what you're talking about, the back to the future model for portable benefits, it's a 19th century entity called the craft union, the building trades. Mm -hmm. Think of a carpenter, an electrician, an operating engineer. They work on a job six weeks, nine months. They build a bridge, they build a skyscraper. That's one employer, then they go to another employer. Why is that such a great job of, in the working class of America? Their health care, their, their pension, all their benefits are, go from job to job to job. Even when the economy's bad in Detroit and they go out to Los Angeles, they become travelers in the, in, in the language of the, of, the, of the billing trades. That Los Angeles employer still pays into their health care benefits in Detroit. So before we you, know how to do it. Before you take off, let me ask you this. Yes. Is there anybody in the national scope, anybody running for president you think is being serious about the kind of needs you see workers requiring in this new economy? I think there are a lot of great candidates for president. Um, if you want to talk about who's putting out big ideas on this, Elizabeth Warren is certainly leading the way. We need to, the, the Wagner Act, our basic law about how workers will have voice and power in the U.S. economy is from 1935. It's way outdated. She's thinking about ideas that I support, for example, that workers ought to have a seat on corporate boards that workers ought to be able to organize in new ways. So I think that she's leading the way, but there a lot of our presidential candidates would support the kind of basic reform we need in both the area of worker training and in the area of trade so that we don't have situations like all our jobs going to Mexico. And I guess I can't let you go before I ask you this. Uh, impeachment, yes or no? Impeachment. Impeachment inquiry, yes or no? Uh, I'm not, well, here's where I'm at on impeachment. The president has committed multiple impeachable offenses. I've been saying that for months. We, in order to impeach the president successfully, we've got to get the public and Republicans on board. We're not there yet. So we need to continue to aggressively tell the story, investigate, and tell the story. 
Americans get their news from television. Until we have Mr. Mueller, Mr. McGahn, other people telling the story of what happened, both within the Mueller report and more broadly with the emoluments clause and so forth, on live TV, like you, you know, on shows yeah. like yours, it's not going to happen. So we have work to do yet. All right, Annie Levin, thanks for being here. On so Rising. great. All nice right. to see you. Thank you. We are going to be right back with a little more Rising just after this. Thanks for being here.